We're good. Thanks, you. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everybody. We're going to close that door and burn it. If anybody knocks, let them let them in. I'm sure they'll hear it. So, welcome, everybody. We've got. Uh, I want to pass these out and let you know what's coming up for book club next time. So we've got Elaine Taylor, and she's coming May 27th, and she's memoir. And if you, if she has, she had an ebook that was 99 cents that I offered in December. I don't know. I think some of you took advantage of that. Yeah. yeah. So good, good, good. And if you are not on my mailing list, I'd love for you to be on my mailing list. I've got, got most of you are. So it's awesome. And I've got a few of these left, um, which is tomorrow. So tomorrow is the conference for the TAF, which is Triangle Area Freelancers. So they are a really nice group of people. And we usually had it at Wake Tech, but this time it's at the McKinnon Center. So if anybody, it's tomorrow. Just found these. I'm like, oh, okay. to get that, need to get that going. And I've got, I've got books here for sale. Most of you have my books, but I'll let you know they're there. And there's a few people here. If you could raise your hands, they're from Linda Chambers Group. And your name is Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. Thank you for coming. Hi, Alice. And you have uh, Linda is a good, good friend of mine, and we, and she's been doing a beginning memoir class while I've been teaching the advanced memoir classes. And there's more information for the advanced memoir class, which will be starting August 18th here in this classroom. Uh, and it will be running six weeks. And for the very first time, there'll be three hour sessions versus two and a half hours. So we're having more time to share, which I heard, which I heard was what a lot of people wanted. So that was, and then we're, uh, Roberta was part of my fiction writing class, my very first daytime fiction. And we're having another daytime fiction in October. That was, it went by really fast. Yeah, it was really, really, really good. And again, it means it was meeting here. Is there another person from Linda's class? I think there was another. Not yet. Not yet, okay. We've all been invited. Okay, okay, cool. All right, and this is, if this is your first time, yeah, so it's uh, Charlotte's first time and Richard's first time. Yes. Yep. And the, uh, hey, nice to see you again. I'm like, nice. Oh, like, I just put it together. <laughs> I was like, hey. <laughs> hey. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Wonderland Book Club started eight years ago. Water for Ele Elephants was the very, very first book we read. And it started at Cameron Village Library. And then we moved here three years ago when I had the dedicated space. And then it became uh, really, really nice because I didn't have to worry about scheduling with them anymore. I could have the whole calendar. And that was also the year where I decided it would be really fun to have live, offered, uh, live authors every month where we would read their book, and sometimes they were local, and sometimes they were not. And we would read their book and take them to lunch and get to know them. So it would be. Uh, serving the purpose of the North Carolina Writers Network, which is to bring readers and writers together and have a speaker every month. And to make it a little different, or maybe a little difficult, is that it helped folks to read the book. Because I was doing a lot of networking meetings for writers, and all it was was a speaker, but there was no homework involved. And we got a lot of people who were, um, I think, wasting the speaker's time a little bit. So I'm um, saying, well, how can you publish my book? And I said, well, that's not quite the purpose of the Writers Network. So we. I mean, that's why um, it serves both where you, the participants have to do a little homework and read the book sometimes, or read some of the book, and then our authors are really thrilled because they say, hey, my, uh, I, I came to a meeting and they all read the book, and most book clubs are not like that. So that's what makes us different. And we would love for you to join us on meetup.com, which is one Glam book club, and that way we can share and have reviews and post the group picture. And, all things like that. So after book club, we are going to, hey Tracy, and we're going to lunch at Nabachi. Can I, show, can I have a show of hands who is uh, one, two, two, three, four. So I got seven. So if anybody wants else to join us. It was hard because I was trying to extrapolate. Well, if I have 15, then half of 15 is so. Uh, there's room if you if you do want to come. We've got that covered. And did anyone go to the writers conference, the spring conference? 
it was really nice, as usual, lots of things going on. Some people tailor the conference to the master classes. I took a lot of the social media classes. It's, it's very flexible for a one-day conference. You can do as much as you can in different of the settings. But it was really nice. A lot of people, 130, 140 people. So How many? 140, I think. So Only 40 people? 140. Oh, 140. Yeah. Good, good. So it was a large That's a good number. Setting. Really good number. Welcome. Sorry. No, you're yeah. We're talking about the North Carolina Writers Network here. <laughs> and the fall conference will be November 4th through 6th at the Crabtree Marriott. And I got two speakers for it this week. So I'm really excited. Diane Chamberlain. Some of you may know her. And she writes fiction. She's very prolific. And she's probably one of the very few. Because there's a lot, a lot of literary people. and. Sometimes literary novels don't get into Walmart or Sam's Club or Target, and there's a few uh, Raleighites that Raleigh authors that have that opportunity, and she's one of who have the opportunity. So you may see Diane's books at Target. Now. Well, she will be our I think August or May book club person in 2017. So already the list in 2017, we only have five more slots available. And I'm trying to do a balance of memoir and fiction. So if I get more fiction. And poetry is where I'm looking for because we have enough nonfiction and memoir. And if I don't get the fiction or poetry that I need, we'll be reading classics or books that are part of the zeitgeist. And my writing, my, my fiction writing group just finished All the Light We Cannot See. So definitely that would be on the book club list if I don't have enough fiction authors. So because the purpose of the book club is to read a variety and we can't have all one genre. <laughs> so, that's the, if we run into that issue, I'll uh, be happy to make sure that y'all read a good meaty book. And there's always Grapes of Wrath. So. <laughs> we did that three years ago. We, did, we couldn't stop talking here. We had a three hour book discussion. So it's good stuff. Okay, well, let's get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to just be over here. Okay. Yeah. I will introduce Alice as if she doesn't need an introduction. Yeah. I didn't realize I had to say so much about Alice. Don't try to repeat. Mm -hmm. She talked about Wonderland Book Club, which I have seen the last three years change from a book club author's meeting to a writer's author community, which is probably the best kept secret in Raleigh's literary community. This is one of the most wonderful yeah. things that we have. And she's actually a prolific writer. We are going to enjoy some of her poetry today. She has several collections of poetry. Also, she has been a Pushkar Prize nominee. Uh, her work has appeared in many places, from the News and Observer, Broad Re River Review, The Pedestal Man Magazine, Soundies Review, and others. Alice is also an editor, as many of you know, and has helped a lot of people to, with the writing. And also, she has uh, created two anthologies, tattoos and Creatures of Habitat, in which I have had the pleasure to contribute one story. And she is also very active in the North Carolina Writers Network. She's part of the board, and she has been event host and also presented. I attended to one of your workshops in there. And the third wheel of her growing business is actually teaching, and she has been teaching and creating a community of students, both nationally and internationally, and she has taught all kinds of things, including comedy and memoir mm -hmm. and fantasy and all other kinds of things. And she, so as many of you know, she's a social media master. Some of us a mastermind, <laughs> but I think it's, and she has developed a huge platform online that we all benefit. I remember someone telling me, every time that I log online, she's there, she's everywhere. Uh, and I think we forget that this is a very important thing that connects all of us in this river of information. Uh, we all benefit from that. I have received notices about awards that I think competed for. I wouldn't know all of that without her. And she is also what we used to call a multiple threat because she's not only a writer but also an Irish dancer. She plays violin, guitar, and she's going to show us some of that today, I think. And so far as I know, she lives in Raleigh with her husband, two children that we have the pleasure to know, and four birds that we don't have so much pleasure in knowing here. <laughs> and the latest edition, which is Mr. Nibbles, your guinea pig. 
Uh, my far daughter's guinea pig. Yeah. So, <laughs> far, so far as I know, no white rabbit with a pocket watch. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you for everything that you That was know. the best introduction I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured I'm going to sit down now and we can do introductions. And introductions will start with Cal. I'm not even looking at Cal. Do the first. So, um, first name and where you live, and how long you've been in Wonderland. Uh, my name is Cal Nord, and I'm a poet. I'm on the board of the North Carolina Poetry Society, and I live in Raleigh. And uh, lived in Raleigh for I don't know, about seven years. Before that, I lived in Apex for a long time. Um, this is my second visit to the Wonderland Book Club. And I had to do it partly because my alter ego is Cal the Whale Shark on the bottom of page 15. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, and the poetry, um, normally if you look at what a writer writes and it may seem autobiographical, it's, you usually should consider it to be fiction, especially when she refers to these being old. <laughs> but that and was the turning point in Bruce's life. He <laughs> changed well, Bruce's life. That, that's an absolute <laughs> fact. <laughs> and I'll pass it on to Q. Uh, Q, I'm uh, from Holly Springs. I write children's and YA fiction. Been here six months or so. <coughs> I'm Roberta, I'm from Raleigh, and I've been coming here around the nice. Something like that. And I, I think I've been in Wonderland forever, though. <laughs> oh, I'm probably. <laughs> I'm, I'm Peggy. This is my second meeting. I don't write, but I do read, so I'll be your customer for whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Paget, and I live in Raleigh, and I think I've been here about two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been here about two years. Paget was our first meeting for the Wonderland Book Club. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and there's a seat right there. You just moved that. So. And novel number three just finished, and we are going to have a launch. Yay! Yay! Yay. <laughs> launch will be at the end of the summer, and I'll keep you all posted. And we can put that on Wonderland. So you know, just great. send me the information, and I'll That's make great. it. I'll make it a, a, a scheduled yeah. event for Wonderland. That's great. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lydia, and like Peggy, I'm an avid reader and a would-be writer. At least I've found my genre. <laughs> 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 we'll do, we can do the back row and then come back to work. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm Nellie. Uh, I'm always amazed at uh, our poet. Alice, because she can pull in something out of Bruce the Sharp, Marsha, Marsha. How would you ever get Marsha, Marsha in the middle of a poem about a shark? <laughs> I'm Charlotte. I belong, I'm a member of Linda Chambers' uh, memoir class. I've never, ever thought I could be a writer. I'm still not sure. My children seem to think so. Uh, I'm an avid reader. Pretty good talker, they say. <laughs> Mom, if you can tell stories, you can write stories. <laughs> so Linda Chambers invited us to her this class here today to meet Alice, and I'm happy to be here. I've been in Raleigh for nine and a half years in Cleveland, Ohio. And Linda's class is right after our Correct. Meeting. Correct. Okay. Mm. I'm Tracy Barton Barrett and I'm freezing. <laughs> oh, Is anybody really? else cold or no? Why? Okay. okay. All right. Anyway, <laughs> um, and I just launched my my first book, Very Deep in Our Hearts, which looks like we have. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. And it's our March book club. Yeah. In 2017. So y'all come back now. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very I'm very pleased with how it is now. I made some tweaks to it, and now it's it's good. So. Um, I've lived in the Triangle, thank you. 
And ironically, I'm from Michigan, so, you know, my blood never got thick. So <laughs> I, I'm always piled up. Um, I teach psychology, and I've been here almost 10 years. But I'm very pleased to be here with like-minded people. Um, it really helps to get out of the academia and into the writing, which is really helpful. This, this is a good group. It really so is. So we do homework. A little homework. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> a little bit of homework. Now here. I get it instead of giving it, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, hi, y'all. I'm uh, Richard Ostrander. Everybody calls me Dick, Dickie, Dixter, whatever. It's okay. And uh, I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, Cumberland County, really. I live right on the, the, the border between Sampson County and, North, and uh, Cumberland County. I'm a published writer, and this is my first time here. Just happy to be here. Thank you for being here. Welcome. 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 I just learned I'm maybe a Dulamite, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I write science fiction, although my short fiction tends to be more fantastical than science fiction. Um, I'm Jenny Batterson. I live in Cary. Um, I've been in the, coming to the book club intermittently probably for a couple of years now. Um, I love to read. Um, I write compulsively, um, not generally for publication, but I'm working on that. Um, and um, before Carrie, I lived in Richmond, Virginia, uh, Montpelier, Vermont, Bujumbura, Burundi, and various places in China. My name is Suzanne Boswell, and I've had two nonfiction books published. Uh, if, and this is a credit to Muffin, something Muffin posted on, on <laughs> Facebook. If, 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 I don't think everyone knows Muffin is Patrick. Oh, I'm sorry, Padgett, Padgett, I'm used to calling her Muffin. Um, if, if asked to describe myself in one word, I would say, doesn't follow directions. <laughs> one, one word. This is just another um, came here four, almost four years ago, retired, and have been here about uh, three years, mm -hmm. attending fairly regularly. Very regular. And um, until last fall, I had the only articles I've ever written were more like research articles. But thanks to Alice, I started memoir writing last fall. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of made me happier than I've been for a long time. <laughs> um, I have really enjoyed myself in writing my memoir. Oh, yeah. hi. Rain, late. Um, Boston to Raleigh to Wake Forest, uh, physical therapy by trade, and um, a writer by heart. A regular Wonder Man? Yes, regular yes, regular for regular. two or three years, and I've, I've been blessed with the, all that Alice offers for eight or ten years now. Oh. I think Aaron's old life. My daughter's Aaron. So okay. Like yeah, like yeah, that would be about right. Uh, recently enjoyed a fabulous poetry workshop with her. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited because we have ten people coming for self-publishing workshop, and Jorge's coming. I think anybody else here is coming. But yeah, that one will be at page 158 books as well. Which, by the way, if you're a local author or have friends who are local authors, Suzanne and Dave Lucy own page 158 books, which is on White Street. It's 158 White Street. And the address is on your yellow copies. It's on the very, it should be there because I do a lot of events. If it's not, let me know. It should be, that should be the first event. And they are so generous to local authors. Another bookstore that's very generous to local authors is the Book Bar in North Raleigh at Falls River Town Center, where the Food Lion Shopping Center is, and Ace Hardware. They will sell your book full price without consignment. So my book is fourteen dollars, and then I get I sell one to someone, and I get fourteen dollars back. So I don't know if anybody is taking advantage of that, but please do that. And if you are an author and you're wondering where to sell your book, please don't hesitate to email me. I have a list, and I'll have, be happy to help you. That's what we're all about. It's, I'm a North Carolina Writers Network regional rep. I don't know, I think, I'm assuming everybody knows that, but you may not know that. And this 
club is part of the outreach efforts for the North Carolina Writers Network. So if you're wondering why I push it so hard, it's because it's co-sponsored by the network and I'm on the board. So it's, it's uh, and that's just, that was probably one of the best things that happened to me in 2013. So the book, Heroes Without Capes, I wrote, oh yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a nice segue, 2013. And the book, so we, uh, my first two books, well my very, very first book was uh, Right Lane Ends. And you can get it on Amazon uh, for a lot of distributors. They they all say autographed by the author. I only have two copies in my house because I didn't I didn't buy a whole lot of copies. And that was self-published by Catawba Press, which no longer exists. And if you do you do get your hands on one, there's one copy at page 158 books. So they do have one copy there if you want to buy that. But they that was my first one in 2006, 10 years ago. And my company, Right From the Inside Out, is 10 years old. So in 2006, I was starting to get poetry awards, awards and decided that would be a really, really good thing to do, to put a book together to help make me an expert and authenticate what I wanted to do, which is this. This is exactly what I wanted to do 10 years ago. And to teach everything that Jorge said about me. <laughs> so we can go back there. And then I, I knew the next step I had to do was make sure that I wouldn't publish another self-published book because I got my goal was to get in and then once I was in I said okay well I know I if I want to be a poet that moves along the ladder of poetry you can't self-publish you have to go small press and most publishers are not Random House doesn't do poetry so it's all small press or university press and there fortunately in North Carolina there's two big ones there's Main Street Rag, which is my publisher out of Charlotte. Some of you have met Scott Douglas, and he is the owner, operator, toilet brush cleaner. I mean, he does everything at Main Street Rag. He's done it for 20 years. And the other poetry press in North Carolina is Kevin Morgan Watson, or Kevin Watson, and he owns hey, uh, Press 53. And that is poetry books only, no chapbooks. And novels and no memoirs. They used to do memoirs, but no longer. So it's short stories and novels. And he's very, very picky. And he told me to tell you guys, uh, hi. <laughs> and he said, he said uh, the writing is everything. And if you want to get your work done, just spend more time on the writing than anything else. So spend time on the writing, enter contests when you feel your work is ready, and the writing will always come through. If your work isn't ready, people will let you know that. And I had an opportunity to help someone who thought his work was ready and it wasn't quite ready. And anyway, it was like, it was funny because um, we were reading All the Light We Cannot See and Meg's story was in the acknowledgments. And I actually, we were doing back and forth emails. I know, and she's the <laughs> nicest person. And I said, well, I'm gonna help my client. And his, his book wasn't ready. So, and, and uh, so that was one of those things I kind of knew, but he was insisting me to send it out to different people. But the, the lesson here is your work has to has to be ready, which comes back to me. I I was ready with a whole bunch of work, a whole bunch of poetry in uh, 2010 and 2011, 2012. So my two other chapbooks, which were published by Main Street Rag, Unfinished Projects, and After the Steaming Stops, which some of you own, and they're also um, they're over there too, were uh, my next books, and they were about uh, my dysfunctional family and pretty much everything. Uh, from age 12 and below, so it was everything. Because when I was a kid, I figured I'm gonna be a writer someday and I'm just gonna collect all this crazy stuff that's happening with my family, and I did. So everything, I remembered, I have a photographic memory, so I remembered everything, and, and poetry was my vehicle. So it's, uh, poetry really, really helped me. But memoir also helped me because I have a memoir poet using, using that. So in 2012, 2013, I was, I was like, wow, I have no other, I want to go in a different direction. I don't want to keep doing the dysfunctional family stuff, which I'm so well known for. <laughs> and because it wasn't healing me, um, I was still stuck in this victim. <clears throat> so in 2013, a couple good things happened. Once, one was I joined uh, Unity Church of Raleigh, and that was a good thing because I didn't have any spiritual component in my life, and that helped me a great deal. I was Unity Church of Triangle, but not going at all, at all, and. So I, I needed something to help me there because I needed, uh, I felt I was too, I was running into, I was getting my own way, pretty much. And if you want to know more about that, you can read my blog. So that's, uh, I get pretty personal there. 
the, the other one was my poetry was not good enough because I was switching focus. I was going from memoir to fiction. And I shared it with Scott, my publisher, and he says it's not ready. And it was a little, it was discouraging. He just said, wow, that was a suck fest. I'm like, wow, OK. Uh, moving on. Um, but thank you for being honest. <laughs> and that I kept, and I said, OK, well, I, I'm going to keep working on this and because I trusted his opinion. And, and another thing, if you're not really sure your work is ready, I think it's okay to put it out there as, as in an open mic. Um, and he may disagree, but I think it's okay because the whole point is you're showing up and you're gonna get, I like to do it because I got feedback right away so I could course correct. And I'd rather get that negative feedback so I can quickly pivot rather than knowing that nothing is going, you know, I think I'm so great and then I keep going the wrong way for a while. So that's, uh, that would be, that's my view on things. And then, I, I uh, so 2013 was, I felt a little lost, so I joined Unity, and my kids loved it immediately. My husband doesn't go to church, he's Jewish, but that has nothing to do with that. He just doesn't, he doesn't go to church. And so I, I really was really, um, I needed that. Uh, the second part, and it plays, it plays into the book, by the way. And the second part was I, I had uh, I went through Reiki training. Reiki, I'm a Reiki master, and I have I had my Reiki one, Reiki two, Reiki, Reiki. If you don't know, <coughs> is the ancient Japanese healing art of hands. So the the client is fully clothed. They have their shoes off. That's the only thing. Shoes off. Um, they can have bare feet or socks. It's cool. And the I you know you lay the hands either on the person if they prefer or if they do not want any touching, they can just hover because. And I've taken classes for it, and I had to go through a, a whole bunch of memorization and and, uh, and homework, a lot of homework. And we had to put together a thesis project at the end of our master class. And it was a whole year of training. And you can only do it by someone who's been sanctioned by the board of the Reiki. And it's, I mean, there's these fast, <laughs> fast action Reiki classes you can take anywhere, but I, I didn't do the fast action. <laughs> what are examples where you use Reiki for uh, someone? Pretty much all the time. And because what it does, let's say I was talking to a young woman and she said, it, it sharpens your instincts. And she said, I'm going to, I, she said, I, I'm looking for a referral. And I said, in 10 days or less, you're going to get a referral. Um, it hap I manifested a referral for her in six hours. So sometimes it's, it's clearing the path and getting out of your own way. And that's how I Reiki helped for me. But during that 2013 class, I had to go through a lot of garbage, a lot of brain garbage, a lot of body garbage, and I was going through a lot of stuff. The, in um, I think it was May or June, I started having these dreams, uh, insistent dreams of getting a violin. So I manifested a violin. The dream started on Monday, right after Reiki training, and then on Thursday, I had a violin in my hands. And then um, the next week, I got a violin teacher. And she, oh, you like that? She was a Reiki practitioner and teacher. Oh. <laughs> and she also helped me finish up my my classes because my teacher wasn't teaching me in the method I needed to be. I think she was more auditory and I needed more visual auditory, so there was, I was losing. I was like, I'm so frustrated, I can't do it. But suddenly all these teachers came to me. I said, wow, I really needed, I really needed this. Again, that's also how the book came to be. And, and then my daughter turned five. She, I guess she was five, going, yeah, she was, uh, she's gonna turn six. So she was Erin, some of you have met Erin. I thought it would be cool for her to do an activity either. She's a Girl Scout. She's a very active Girl Scout now. And, um, she she uh, sold 449 Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> <laughs> we purchased those cookies, so she thanks you. We thank you. But she was, uh, before she was a Girl Scout, I wanted to figure out, well, what does she, what does she want to do? Because she's talented, and what can she do? And Irish dancing was on the list. And then she said, no way, Jose. I am not taking Irish dancing. And I went to, we went to a couple open houses and looked at a few of the schools in the area. And I chose a non-competitive school because it fit my hours and I learned, and I'm not in that school anymore. So I, I went competitive and actually I'm, I really like it <laughs> uh, because I, it, it's harder, but it was harder on everything. But I, I felt I was really, really learning more and it was keeping me sharper. So anyway, I joined the non-competitive school also in 2013. So you got violin, you got Reiki, and you got... And you got violin, Reiki, and dance. So that was all 2013. I also got on the board of the North Carolina Writers Network. The only problem in 2013, I wasn't publishing anything. And I didn't get any, I got so many rejections, and I didn't get anything. I think I got one. Running with Snakes was the only poem that was published. 
So I was pretty depressed, and then there's, let's see, there's nobody here, my little poetry group, okay, good. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that part from the video, but it was, uh, <laughs> my, my poetry group, I was in a, in a, glo uh, in a United, it was a North American, a lot of people from North America, Iowa, uh, Missouri, there's a fellow who was uh, originally from Australia, but he was in Vancouver, so we would all, he would call in, Three years ago, we had about six of us on, not on Skype, but we'd go to meeting, and we would share our, our poems, and they didn't like any of my poems, and they couldn't understand any of my poems, and all the poems actually are all in the book. They're all, they're all here. My poetry teacher, Juliet, didn't get anything. So I was getting discouraged, and I said, wow, nobody gets my stuff, but I can't compromise. I can't, I want, this is the poem, these are the poems I want to express, and I'm frustrated because you're not accepting it. So what I did was, I think that, that poetry group dissolved, so the virtual one dissolved, and then my physical poetry group was still meeting, and I think I dissolved that one too, because they, they didn't get any of my poems, and it was leading to frustration, because I was the group leader, so it was a little awkward. <laughs> so that, that one dissolved, and then in uh, about a year later, I started sending them to my friend Richard in, in Charlotte, and he got me, He's, we, we just got each other. That is how he was, he's acknowledged, Richard Allen Taylor, he's acknowledged here in the book. And there was only two people, uh, Jane Andrews, I mean, you know Jane and Richard, they're the only two people who looked at the book prior, were my only two editors, because everybody else, um, they uh, we had gone our separate ways. And so this was a very dividing book, and it was hurtful, because I was thinking, well, what do I do? But you have to keep going. So I had a vision, I was getting into Willie Nelson at that point, and I had started guitar, uh, not very, not very good, but a really crap instrument before I got my tailor there. And started guitar with a new teacher also in 2013. And that, I got into Willie Nelson. And Willie Nelson's new, at the time, his new album was about heroes. And that's where I got the heroes without capes because I figured there's like heroes automatically think of them as having capes, so what if they don't? And that was, and I had the, so I had the book title in 2013, um, which was, and Scott let me, the title, but the title came first. Then, in uh, 2014, my uh, this picture was taken. So that was before I had the book. So that picture was taken, and with the dress that I'm wearing. I didn't wear that dress today because it needs to be clean for tomorrow. <laughs> That's that was the reason. Well. Okay, so hold that, just hold that thought and I'll keep going with that. That was the day my son decided to let Ray, the cockatiel, outside, outside. Um, and that was also, uh, Ray took one for the team because that was when, this, it was a, a terrible low point uh, in our lives that, it's not funny, but um, <laughs> Daniel um, almost sacrificed the bird. The, the bird lived after, uh, what, like 60 hours in IC, bird ICU. Oh and he survived, but he got gut punched by the talon of the teenage hawk. Oh and my he God. just it, it all came through, oh and my. he survived. And then, so while it was after, right after the, the photo shoot, Daniel calls me, and I'm getting a birthday present at page 158 books, which is the old one at Storytellers. I get the call, like I killed, I killed Ray, I killed Ray. What? What? Get home! I'm like, oh my. So I was so mad at myself for for taking 45 minutes to to get my photo done and leaving him at home. And then I found out later that he had released the bird three times before outside. Oh. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm gonna kill you. Uh, so I rescued the bird. Uh, Ray lives, because he's awesome and amazing. And then I said, Daniel is, this is, he needs help, he needs help. And unfortunately that was all snowstorms. So we couldn't get him to a psychiatrist for like another month or so. And he got diagnosed with ADHD and he's doing great. We, uh, and he joined scouts and he's, he's off in DC. but. He's a wonderful young man, so some of you know him, but he was, that was a low point. And uh, I was like, well, okay, <laughs> what does it mean to be a hero? There's, there's something here. And uh, so I had to really adjust myself and figure out you know, who I am, but that would say, that would be the, that was, a, that was, that was hard. And then um, in 2014, I think with that low, that low point, um, my creative juices just started kicking in. And I was like, whoa, got another poem, got another poem, got another poem. And then Daniel, his creative juices were kicking in, he started writing poetry too. So we were in competition almost, and then he started winning more awards with the North Carolina Poetry Society. <laughs> like, oh, well, you're winning more than I am. Okay, I gotta get up on this. I gotta get up on this. So, and then 2014 things really started rolling, and then I, 
I decided to uh, take my love of pop culture and Star Wars and throw Boba Fett into the mix. And Boba Fett is, if you don't know, he's he's my most favorite hero in the book. And I spent I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time. <laughs> and Boba Fett is a bounty hunter, and I, his voice came to me right away. So if you're your fiction writers out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where the voice just comes straight through, and it happened after the bird incident. So uh, thank you, Ray. You took one for the team. So I I got the. I got the image and of uh, Boba Fett, of course, but we don't know Boba Fett very well because he has five lines of dialogue in all the three original Star Wars movies. And I'm not talking about the prequels, I'm talking about the original ones. And the basics, the basic outline is that his father was killed in front of him when he was nine or ten years old. He adored his father. His father was a very good man to him. I mean, probably not to people that he was hunting, but a good man, a good community leader. And the Mandalorians, which are the race of people that, or the community of people that Boba Fett is a part of, are war warrior farmers. And that's why there's a, a wheat frond on Boba Fett's costume. So they, and they have a squid patch, which shows the fierceness, but also they're farmers. And I use that a little bit in the book, where Boba Fett realizes he should change sides from the Empire to the rebels or be an independent because his people are going to be starving and he's understanding how he can't be so selfish but he's not quite ready to make that leap into a true hero and yeah did that history come out later in comic books after the three uh movies? it's expanded universe yeah so all was all was comic books right. and i was i was reading my star wars comics when so when the so three movies were written that kind of back history didn't exist. No, it did exist. Yeah, it it did exist because there was a comic book movies. at the same time. Yeah, well, I didn't know. yeah there was a comic book. I think mm -hmm. that, uh, they changed some because yeah. he was more. Cold. So there was always a history, and there was always people writing, and that was. And I so I, I took things, and I also studied a lot of fan fiction while I was looking into his history, and it. I was researching. I mean, I wouldn't plagiarize, but I was like, oh, okay, well that makes sense, and that makes sense, and I also had. This, the comic book as a kid, so I was using that research, and the fan fiction people were also using the same source. So I said, okay, well I can I can weave that in. So he's a bounty hunter from Warrior Farmers, and he likes to read. That's part of his. Uh, that's true. It's part of his profile. He loves to read, and he. Um, so he's he's more than you think he is. He's very smart, and but he's also someone who almost waits too long. He's not too impulsive, but sometimes he can be really, the part, problem is he can be really impulsive at the wrong time when there's a bad, bad guy, so he takes charge, and he will, he's, and so he has a sense of justice, which what a lot of young people, a lot of boys love, because he's tough, but he's not a good, good guy, but if he sees a wrong, he fights it, and that is another part that appealed to me. Well, bounty hunters hang out in bars and really low, low places, like the Garth Brooks song, um, it's so easy to become an alcoholic, and he fits the traits of an alcoholic, a potential alcoholic, where he's a control, he's a control freak, he's a perfectionist, he goes, he can go to extremes in an instant, and he also suffered a tremendous trauma by seeing his father killed in front of him, and he's trying, and he also knows that, should I be a bounty hunter, he's trying to still numb that, and it's easy, and he doesn't get along with people too, so there's, there's a lot of masks, and who, who is real, and he has a trouble. He has trouble being authentic because he doesn't know anybody. He doesn't trust anybody. Because anytime he trusts someone, they turn on him. And so he, there's a tremendous amount of abandonment. And I could feel with the abandonment issues from my earlier books, I could feel drawn to. So part of Boba Fett is me. Every single character in here is a. There's a little bit of me in every single one. And that was Boba Fett. I said, Oh, wouldn't that be cool if you went from that world to our world? And he hangs out and he uh, he goes to AA meetings and he starts he starts. Uh, feeling, you know, working his way back to taking control of his life, where he doesn't have to do the same scripts as what he's done in the past. And that's healing. That's healing right there, where you're not a victim anymore. And that, but you have to get it, you have to change it up here. You can't keep believing you are a victim. And that was, that was cool. And not just with someone who has an addiction, but anything, anything. Uh, so, you know, you were bullied as a child, and you still feel that you're a victim of bullying, and you, that affects your, your personal and your professional life. So it can be the same thing for that. Or if you were codependent or you were, came from a, a family of alcoholics, you're not one, but you, you, you survived that. So I figured that would be a good, he would be a good avatar. 
And then Benedict Arnold came into the picture where, as a little kid, I was into American history, and I knew that he was the bad guy, and I'm a big George Washington fan. I was like, he betrayed George Washington, my buddy. You know, how, how can you do that? <laughs> and there was a book coming out by Nathaniel Philbrook in May, so this month, about the two guys, the two bros, George and Benedict, a love story. <laughs> it's not called that, but it's, uh, it, it's about the two, the two men. And Washington and Mount Vernon, Benedict Arnold was in the top, his top generals. There's, and there were many, and he was one of the five, his five top generals. And Washington felt personally betrayed that happened. Because uh, he was one of his mentors. He was not a tour mentor, he was an actual mentor. And Did Benedict, Nathaniel Green come in later, or was he uh, the top five? Yeah, Nathaniel was there too. Yeah. In that time? In that time, yeah, he was there too. And so was uh, Henry Knox. Probably the youngest, right? Mm -hmm. He was there too. So, the, so Benedict Arnold. Um, He's my answer. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so Benedict Arnold, we were Sorry. in Halifax. No, we were in uh, not Halifax. We were in New Brunswick, in St. John, New Brunswick, and there was a big mural of Benedict Arnold. Like, Holy nuts, Batman! What is he doing here? Because we've never seen that in America. Can you imagine a mural of Benedict Arnold on a wall in America? I mean. Wow, this blew my mind. Oh, it's good Canada. That's right, we're in Canada. Well, he lived a long time in Canada, and he was a wonderful, um, very talented entrepreneur and merchant. And he he didn't go to school. He didn't have a proper education because his family ran out of money. His father was an alcoholic and disappointed his family. His also he had four siblings, three siblings, and um, all of them died except his his. Um, his most favorite, Hannah, Hannah, his sister, who took care of his three children from his first marriage and took care of, um, well, his, and then took care of his first three children, and then uh, he had five more kids with Peggy Shippen. So he, all together, he has he had eight kids, and most of them, I think, lived to adulthood. So there's a lot of Arnolds walking around now. But anyway, so Benedict, uh, his history, if you want to know more about that, I did a whole blog post about, about why he is what he is. And then I wrote the poem in here, and I did a song called Benedict Arnold Sings the Blues, or One Time Hero, and I'll, I'll sing that song for you. So that was, that was actually my first song that I wrote, and it was the poem that a lot of people didn't like in my poetry group. Because it starts off, it's so easy to hate me. And one of my poet friends said, I can't believe you said that. It just doesn't make sense. I'm like, <laughs> So easy to hate me. Well, that's the whole point of you know, you hate someone who betrayed your country, and, but she didn't know the history. She didn't know who Benedict Arnold was. And I was really? like, oh, oh, you know, that's oh, the thing. Yeah. So if you don't know. If you don't know history. You're kind of lost. And that was so that that was a pair puller. The uh, and then Benedict Arnold was one. Captain Bly uh, was my other B. So I had my three B men. I had Boba Fett, Captain Bly. Well, Bly, but you know, he's still a B. And Benedict. So Captain Bly, I knew his story because I had read his logs um, back in the 90s. I had read his personal log books. I had read everything about him. And he also got betrayed. So you see a theme here of people who trust and they get betrayed. And that, to me, what do you do with that? And I've, you know, I've trusted people and I've been betrayed. I've been abandoned. So I, all these guys, I just felt resonated with. Resonated. And I also like to uh, write male voices over female voices for another reason too. I don't know, I saw the nonfiction that I read growing up or something, but I I, I focused on uh, William Bly at that moment, at that moment where he gets mutiny, and I wanted it to be a funny, outrageous, outrageous uh, contrast. So he's, on one side, he's extremely organized and professional with his guys that are mutinied with him. So they had a little bit of history. There were 19 guys who were mutinied, some of them by choice, some of them just because Fletcher Christian in the bounty did not want them with him. And Fletcher Christian, his motivation was to go back to Tahiti to enjoy the good life of the good women of Tahiti and the warm weather and get out of the British Navy. They were There was a lot of problems why they ended up where they ended up, um, a lot of delays, and it was a peacetime mission. What they were doing is they were transporting breadfruit trees from the West Indies to the East Indies, or the East Indies to the West Indies, to feed slaves. And it was, so that was the whole mission. It was not a wartime mission. And that's why uh, they didn't have a lot of uh, arms on the boat. They didn't have a lot of uh, officers. They were mostly craft people and merchant people and some low people who really didn't want to be there. So it was, it was a, and what Captain Bly did is that he used a, a lot, he made sure everyone, nobody had scurvy. He made sure everybody had lemons because he was a protege of Captain Cook. 
and he saw Captain Cook die. So in a way, that was his father figure, and almost like Boba Fett, where he saw someone die right in front of him, and it affected him greatly. So he was, he wanted, he was the protege of Captain Cook, and he, uh, he implemented everything that Captain Cook did, where having lemons and having regular exercise and having press-ups, the push-ups, and a lot of the guys hated him for it. But what he was doing was he was running a clean ship. And so when you get all the stuff in the 30s of the films, they, they don't share that. But he was, he was an introvert, and he probably didn't have a lot. He was a nerd a little bit, and he was, had a hard time with, uh, uh, he was not an attractive speaker. And, and Fletcher Christian was a lot more attractive and was able to swing everybody's views around. And he, uh, Captain Bly was um, just a very, fairly moral, moral center. So when this happens, he does the most amazing thing. He takes 19 people in a boat that has that much freeboard from dry area to the wet area of a boat, in a 23-foot boat, and the launch boat that was part of the bounty, and they go 4,800 miles. And they all survive, except one guy who gets stoned to death, stoned to death. And then they reach Holland, or they reach a uh, Dutch colony of Holland, <laughs> and then a lot of them die because of disease, because that place was just nasty. But nobody died on the voyage. He's, he helped everybody survive. And what did help was they had big, uh, good winds, and they had a lot of rain. So that was the part of the poem where he says, uh, uh, I hope it's not raining. Oh, crap, it's raining. So <laughs> I lost my hat, you know? And that was from Young Frankenstein. Uh, at least it's not raining. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a reference to that. And that was my husband's favorite movie. Well, at least it's not raining. That's like downpours. Uh, that was funny where you're, you're always, you know, you're just screwed and so forth. So the, my poem started to be a publishing and public, uh, started to get picked up by different publications in 2014. I was getting awards and really, really excited. And then in 2015, I felt that I had enough. So that was just last year. That was just last, uh, this time last year. And um, I, Put everything together for Scott, and didn't hear back. Scott from Main Street Rag, and Scott said um, he waited a month, and I was just going crazy, tearing my hair out, like, what if he hates it? 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 And then, because uh, he waited a whole month to tell me anything, and that was the most time. You know, usually, he's, he's a really quick emailer, and he finally texts me and he calls me and says, I'm thinking about your book, but I have concerns with it. So I, I call him up, and he says, Okay, what's the concern? He says, I don't think anybody's going to get your Boba Fett stuff. I don't think anybody's going to get your Star Wars stuff. And, and by the way, it's not Robert Johnson. It's not Bob Johnson for Robert Johnson. It's Robert Johnson. I said, I said oh, that's it? I mean, I thought it was like, we're not publishing you. <laughs> and I said, well, I can change things. And I told him, I insisted, I said, because there are there is an audience for Boba Fett. He is the top three character in the Star Wars universe. He's top three. First there's Darth, and then there's Han, and then there's Boba Fett. And he says, I don't believe you. I says, believe me, everybody, you've got to believe me. And the Star Wars movie's coming out, and I feel this is great, and I will start a movement. I will, I will get it together. And I, I think there's enough in the book where it will appeal to people who are not who are, are not Star Wars people. And there's other poems in the book, too. So he said, oh, I don't know. And then uh, and he said, what are you doing with the cover? And I said, well, I got this I got this cover, and I got this other cover. And, I, and then I showed him this cover, and he went golden. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. So you remember the... And then I, then I, then he tweaked the colors because this was a, this is a blue dress. If you've seen my dress, it's a blue dress. And he tweaked the colors so he made, matched it to the green dress. And it's not me. It's from my stock photo. So it came because she's moving up on her hero's journey. I wonder if that was. Yeah. No. And the other thing I did mention in 2013 was I was on a radio show with Marilyn Shannon, and she she was really insistent that I had clients, my former clients, call in to, to give me endorsements. And I said, I'm not enough. I'm not enough to talk. I need to bring five people to share what they know what they know about me, which I was a little bit, OK. Well, my good good friend, Margaret Harrell, who is on the second, um, she she's on the, uh, she's like the, the second header, uh, second event header of my events worksheet. She, I edited three of her books. And I wanted her to give her uh, give me her endorsement, and she did on the radio show, and that was, and then she starts about the hero's journey, and I think that was the time where the hero's journey uh, was born, and that's when I started incorporating it into my work. So the hero's journey, and then heroes with Willie Nelson, and then the heroes, with, all that is how the book came together. So you can see it was a lot of moving parts. But going back to what Kevin Morgan Watson, I did not rush this book. I spent three long years and a lot of, a lot of going through. Through everything. 
So that was the, that was it. Do we have any poets in the group? Right here. Yeah, well, you know, I know, I know me, I know, but. Dick, Cal, are there other poets besides Dick and Cal? So just because you've written some poems, does that mean you're a poet? Yeah, you're a poet. You've written poems. Well, I'm a poet then. Okay, good. Raise your hand. You are. Yeah. The first poem I'll share with you is Boba Fett. In a, a, well, actually, um, the Hickory poem. So Boba Fett is going from, and then I'll sing the song. This was a true story. I don't know my Bible very well, and since going to Unity Church, which is not too scripture heavy, it's nice to know a little bit more about the Bible in terms of literature. And what I went to, this was in five years ago, I went to was going to the North Carolina Writers Network Conference in Asheville, from Raleigh to Asheville, and stopped in Hickory, and there was, a, it's about the size of this, of Jeremiah 2911, and it was a mural, just kind of like Benedict Arnold mural, huge, huge mural, and there were bunnies, and rainbows, and, and there were sunflowers, and it had Jeremiah 2911, which God has a plan and a purpose for you to give you hope and a future. I'm paraphrasing. But Jeremiah 29, 11 is a very, very popular verse because it is, it, it really, to me it represents let go of the past and move forward and believe that God, spirit, divine has your back. And I wrote that poem and it didn't get published anywhere. And it, it wasn't a very good poem. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool? Because I already, already did an intro poem. I did the, the first one of the Boba Fett series. I am Boba Fett, the most, and that's page 46. I am Boba Fett, the most notorious bounty hunter in the galaxy. And I had already done that one. So it's going to be cool to, to move him over to Hickory. And Hickory is known to be kind of religious. I don't know if any of you Hickory, but that was, I thought that would be funny. I mean, where on earth can you go into a fast food restaurant <laughs> And have it's a church. It's like it belongs in a church. It doesn't belong to me. To me, it was, it was shocking. They do not have it now. They took it down. So this is page sixty-one. If you want to follow with me, this is Boba Fett at the Chick Fil A in Hickory, and then I'm going to sing the song <laughs> that I wrote from this. My spent leg drags over the brown tile as graceful as a 